Got a quick message from one of our supporters and then we'll be straight into this episode. Now you'll know I do like a good espionage story and the happy traitor is just that. On the surface, George Blake was a charming, intelligent and engaging MI6 officer. However, underneath, he was a ruthlessly efficient Soviet spy. Simon Cooper unravels the real Blake using exclusive personal interviews with the man, research in many languages and the use of the Stasi archives. Don't miss The Happy Traitor, published by Profile Books and available wherever you buy your books. Now, back to today's episode. Oh, there was one time where I almost started World War III. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. This is the British Broadcasting Corporation. Well, who's our first letter from today, Edward? Uh, an old friend of yours, Doris Brian Hartley of Thornton the Field, asking what's being done to build up Anglo Soviet relations. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. Welcome to episode 16 of Cold War Conversations. Before we start, I'd just like to say how humbled I am by the level of interest in the podcast and the kind comments from our many subscribers. The podcast will always remain free, but if you'd like to support us further with a small monthly contribution, then head over to patreon.com slash coldwarpod, where if you sign up, you'll also get access to some exclusive extras. There's also links on the homepage of the website, coldwarconversations.com. Just look for the Patreon logo. Back to the business in hand. Today we're talking to Mark Valley, host of the Live Drop Espionage podcast. Mark served with the US Army as a combat engineer in West Germany and later with the Berlin Brigade. His story gives you an eyewitness account of service in both locations, but also some insight into the training, tactics and dilemmas of service in the army. I'm delighted and honoured to welcome Mark Valley. Hi, Mark. How are you today? Hi, Ian. I'm, I'm wonderful. Thank you. So um, you joined the um, US Army. Why, why did you join the US Army? I love the way you say that. Why did that was the question that I used used to get when I was stationed overseas in Germany? It was like, "Hi, I've been Mark. Da 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 da. da was Mark saying, I'm in the army. Why did you join the United States <laughs> Army?" So it, it's a kind of a familiar question. It sort of brings me back a little bit. Um, I joined because um, well, I grew up in the '60s. I was watching Vietnam on TV. I grew small kind of conservative town. I didn't really have a military family, but my grandfather was in World War II, like a lot of people my age. And um, I wanted to serve in the military at some point. And uh, I thought, well, I started getting good grades in high school. And I thought, well, why not just go for it and just try to get into West Point and then see what happens. So that's a free education as well. It's, um, well, not free. You have to serve five years active duty afterwards. But um yeah, I like the place. I like the idea of, you know, not paying for your education and yeah. uh, really getting a good schooling. Yeah. Were you not fearful of being sent somewhere where you might get shot at? You know, um, I was sort of fearful of it. Yeah. I, 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 but at that time, it was, it was the Cold War, which everybody felt there were only certain places where the Cold War was going on. It was, you know, these little, you know, conventional outbreaks in places like Vietnam you know, or Afghanistan yeah. or, or there was, you know, Berlin or, or something like that. So I didn't really have, really fear that. Everybody kind of had this feeling after 1974 that, oh, okay, Vietnam's over with. We don't have to do that for a while. Yeah. And yeah. when I went in 10 years later, there wasn't really a big, you know, fear of going directly into or threat of going directly into combat. But yeah, that always sort of loomed. Yeah. 
Yeah, because with the British Army, it was slightly different in so much that you could get posted to Northern Ireland. Or, yeah. uh, and yeah. 1982, obviously, we had our uh, little disagreement with the Argentinians as well. Oh, yeah. So you were uh, trained at West Point. When, mm-hmm. when did you know you were going to get posted to uh, Germany? Uh, probably around halfway through my senior year. We, we chose our, our branch first. And I wanted to go aviation, but my eyes weren't good enough. So then I wanted to definitely wanted to go to Germany and go to a station in Europe. And I realized, well, engineers, you know, based on my ranking in the class, that would probably give me my best shot of getting, of getting there. So, um, yeah, so that's pretty much how it worked okay. out. Okay. What, what year was that you arrived in uh, West Germany? So it's West Germany in this early 1988. Right. Okay. Okay. And as part of your um, sort of acclimatization, were you taken to the border to actually see what that was like? No, my first assignment was with the 8th ID kind of along the Rhine River, Um, you know, just kind of south of the Ruhr Valley near Frankfurt. So I was stationed with a unit there. Um, it was an engineer unit that was kind of out in this out in the middle of nowhere called a place called Dexheim. And I actually had to get, didn't even have housing. So I had to get a, get an apartment myself. And, um, I got an apartment, this little wine village named, named Oppenheim. And I was the only American in town. So that was my first experience. And I was there for about a year and a half before I got an early reassignment to Berlin. Right. Why there must be worse places than wine villages to be, uh, oh, I still in. remember the smell of that. Yeah. <laughs> It's got kind of a musty smell. Like behind my apartment, there were all these garages where the people were literally just stomping in barrels of wine, you know? Wow. So I remember that kind of musty smell. Wow. I mean, it's kind of like making sausage, you know? You just kind of want the end product. You don't really want to see what's going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't want to see the manufacturing process at all. Yeah, but it was beautiful. I mean, his, I, got a, I started to get a little bit of a appreciation for the history of the area. That's where George Patton crossed the Rhine, right near the village of Oh, okay. Oppenheim. Built is that that, that famous photo where he's uh, how can I, I, I relieving himself <laughs> into the Rhine? I um, you know, I I started doing some mili- some reenact military reenacting with um, like the war of eight, war of eighteen twelve in my hometown in upstate New York, and you know their fights against the British. But somebody said, "When's the first time you ever did any military reenacting?" And I think now that I think of it, that would probably that has to be the first time <laughs> I ever. <laughs> Did a military reenactment was at that spot in the Rhine River. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Well, we won't be sharing any photos of that. I don't think on no, no, yeah, no, on the show notes. It wasn't that impressive anyway. It's, <laughs> it's, it's General Patton. So. <laughs> um, and what what was the mission of the um, the eighth? The eighth ID. It was it was strange getting there in 1988. We didn't really nobody really knew that the Cold War was going to end in a year or two years, but it, it had more or less become the status quo that, and accepted that, well, you know, if, you know, things do come to push and shove the job of the eighth ID and the rest of most of the army in that area was to kind of stop this expected Soviet offensive through the full, the gap. Yeah. So, um, we had a spot, um, God, I have to look it up on a map, but we, we had a spot where we were going to go. We'd have alerts and we'd load the, you know, mechanized, you know, load all the tracks and the trucks up onto, um, up onto a, up onto a train. And, you know, they would plan on, the plan was to take this train, everything on this train was to an area further East and then set up a defense. So I knew the village that I was going to, in the area that I was going to have to defend. I actually knew my mission better when I was stationed in West Germany than when I got to, when I got to Berlin. And so was there, you know, where you were going to be deployed Were there, were the defensive positions already there or you just knew the location and you'd scouted out various. Uh, well, positions? I got this little briefcase, right. That had all this, information, <laughs> this bizarre thing. It was like, Oh, you know, here's your, here's your death book, you know? Yeah. And, um, I mean, in it we were like some maps and where we we're supposed to go, and of course it was it was classified. It wasn't top secret or anything. And um, I, I thought to myself, I need to get out there and just see to see this place. So I called the the aviation units and um, asked if I could fly my platoon out there. And they said, "Excuse me, 
I said, yeah, I want to fly out there and look at our, nobody had really done that. So they apparently didn't really have anything extra to do. So they sent a couple of helicopters over and I took my platoon to um, the East German border where we were going to, you know, defend against the, the Russian attack. Yeah. And, uh, we just kind of scoped it out. I mean, there weren't any defensive positions. It was really just this quiet, bucolic little village, you know, yeah. kind of traipsed around and asked questions and ate MREs and, um, you know, looked at the terrain and it was all really surreal. It was kind of like, kind of like going on a vacation and saying, okay, when the art, you know, when this, um, post-apocalyptic part of the movie happens, <laughs> yeah. what are we, what are we going to do here? You know? Yeah. And, uh, but there, that said, there were some prepared munitions. What was interesting about West Germany is that everything that was built after the war also had its own, um, destruction plan as well. So most roads, highways, bridges, overpasses, they all, I forget the German word for it, but they all had this one little, um, little door or a little like manhole with a, with a lock. And you had to talk to the, the burgermeister or the chief engineer of whatever village you were in and they had the key. So that was like a little coordination that engineers had to do was to be able to talk to the Germans to say, ah, Mr. Burgermeister, uh, we'd like to blow up your bridge today. Can we, um, you know, can we? So the, can these we, were pre-built demolition chambers that had been built into all these structures. Precisely. Yeah. Wow. Some, they said, already had munitions there. I'd kind of doubt that. But, um, you know, we were supposed to, you know, bring in the TNT and kind of fill those yeah. things up and take care of business. I just wonder how the locals felt with you scouting around obviously thinking about how you were going to fight over this place and you know it must have been a bit weird for them yeah it was i i don't remember i remember much i remember that kind of that that irony that contrast in berlin a little a little more vividly but i remember that village going and talking to a you know talking to a farmer and saying well this is where we'd you know, if they do attack, <laughs> looked at me like I was absolutely insane. Yeah, <laughs> like, like these people had landed in a helicopter in uniforms and said, "Oh, this red army is going to come rolling across." And they just, yeah, they seemed so confused. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and how far was it from the uh, East German border? Oh, that, that spot was probably. I mean, it was less than ten kilometers. Right. Okay. Okay, so you didn't. I remember the helicopters were very. They, they were telling me this. They took me as close as they could to the border to kind of show me what it looked like on the other side. And they said we have to, we can't, you know, spend much time here because sometimes their helicopters would come back with bullet holes in them, and you know they had to be careful. It was a little. That's where I got an appreciation for the border. It was um, the the it it was the you know, the caution that the aviators had when they were flying near the border. I really picked up on that. Yeah. They, they think shit got really serious when they were flying near the border. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess they didn't want any navigation error, which meant they accidentally uh, gone over. Yeah. And they had been shot at, you know, so you never know. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you're there in 1988. When do you get posted to Berlin? Um, so I was there in 1988. One of the jobs I had, I was going to mention was I, I, they put me in charge of this unit that, um, was just going to conduct this 100 mile March in Nijmegen, Holland. And that was the first time they took teams from all over, uh, Europe and NATO. And one of the teams that we marched against for the first time was a Russian team that was sent there. So I got to meet some, some Russians for the first time. And, um, yeah, they didn't speak in English. Some spoke some French and some spoke some German so I could communicate with them. But I, I remember their officer, their, he didn't want anything to do with me. And after about a, I think after like the second or third day of, I mean, it was marching 25 miles a day and then we'd all eat together. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the other soldiers said, look, uh, we can't talk to you anymore. I said, why? I said, Our political officer said to, to stay away from you. And these guys, this is like one kid whispering to me. I'm like, really? What, what's going on? Because they think you're at the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty much any American that's, you know, spoke a different language was immediately suspect. You know, yeah. So. Yeah. So but what I, I went, to, went to Germany. Oh, I studied French when I was younger. I grew up on the Canadian border near Quebec. So I started studying that at a pretty young age. And then 
when I got to Germany, I started studying German pretty much on the plane on the way over. So that was still a work in progress, and, but it got better when I got to Berlin. But okay. going to Berlin, that was an interesting story. I, I, the company commander had not, I mean, sometimes it's who you know in the military. I'd had a, I'd had a tech officer at, at, a, at, the, at one of the courses at Fort Belvoir in Virginia who knew me and he knew this company commander who was looking for a new lieutenant because in Berlin because um, the previous lieutenant had um, taken a convoy through the corridor from Berlin to Helmstedt and had taken a wrong turn. I mean, it's really prescriptive where you're supposed to go. They have a, I still remember they gave you a notebook with these blown, you know, five by seven photographs with like a Sharpie pen, you know, circling the arrows and where you're supposed to go and so forth. But um, that said, it was still a pretty, you know, a pretty tense in, in environment, you know, and you didn't have a GPS lady telling you to turn left or turn right. But anyway, he took a convoy the wrong way and sort of set the East German army on alert. And um, yeah, you couldn't make mistakes when you were stationed in Berlin. They really only took the best and the brightest as far as the officer corps goes. So um, he got immediately kicked out. Right. And, and is that... Then they, then, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, is that because of the the proximity and its location that, you know, they didn't want any accidental incidents i guess yes yes they didn't want people who made mistakes or had accidents yeah <laughs> or, or were an embarrassment or, I, or, I mean yeah. I, i've never done that route but the way i understood it is it was just one motorway from helmstadt to berlin pretty much and there's one there's one um i mean there's one exit you have to take i mean like one but it is yeah it's not that difficult really you just have to kind of stay awake but there is one I remember there was one tricky little change. I don't know, route from, you know, 1A to, you know, route 4 or something like that. I can't remember the yeah. names, but um, there was one little tricky interchange. Yeah. So this guy was effectively doing a one convoy invasion of East Germany. By he turning one, off he the wrong he one I mean, his story might be more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to talk because I, I, I knew him at West Point and he was uh, – yeah, really smart guy, really. You know, he was an engineer as well. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, they sort of let him go. Wow. Okay. So um, what what were your first impressions of, of Berlin? Um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. I've heard you talk on your show that, you know, it's surprising people say, oh, Berlin, you, you just picture this dark city with people wearing trench coats and, you know, you, know, you think everything's black and white, like a Lacari novel. But I, what what really threw me when I first got there was just the the, the trees. I mean, these huge, leafy, deciduous trees everywhere, and the the parks. Um, and you know, the streets were wide, but they weren't they weren't like Hitler wide. They were just you know busy. This was a this was a big, thriving, thriving city. That was the, kind of the first things that brought me. The second thing that kind of threw me. Um, well, I have to go back a little bit because when I when I was assigned to go to Berlin, I I bought this um like BMW, old used BMW for like twenty five hundred dollars or something, and uh, I literally packed everything that I that I owned in this car, and I had a set of flag orders, and I drove from uh you know Mainz to to Helmstedt, and that's yeah. Checkpoint Alpha. So I went to Checkpoint Alpha, and I had to pull up to the through the through the German cross checkpoint into the Russian checkpoint. So you go to the mm -hmm. Russian checkpoint and you have instructions what you're supposed to do. You give your, you take your flag orders inside. And, um, and I thought, you know, what's, what's the harm? I would just say, you know, Dobre Vecha to the guy that took the thing and oh, they wouldn't leave me alone after that. It was, but there was, but I did notice one thing about them. There's this, the soldier who was working the gate. He had a little bit longer hair than mm -hmm. like America's would wear their hair. It was kind of black, a little bit wavy. He was about 6'2". You know, he's wearing the brown wool uniform. But I remember at the time seeing like some dandruff on his shoulders, you know? And, yeah. um, and I thought, well, that really wouldn't fly over on our side, you know? Yeah. And I didn't, and I thought about it later. I thought, well, on one hand, they, they probably want people there, you know, um, looking a little bit less, um, how do you say it? Maybe, maybe looking a little bit more to talk to somebody like oh this guy's this guy's cool you know yeah 
you know, I can talk to him because he immediately was like, oh, it's a bit I was like, oh, I don't know. No, I don't know any of that. <laughs> but anyway, I was nervous as hell because we had to go in this little waiting room and wait for them to um, approve your paperwork. And there was paneling in there, this kind of light colored, like hickory paneling. And there was a table where you sat, this kind of modern looking little little couch with a with a coffee table. And there, were mag- there was all sorts of communist magazines and stuff on there. And uh, they had it literally <laughs> like a little slot that was about six inches wide or about an inch high, like a horizontal slot. And every once in a while, you'd see like eyes appear in this slot in the wall. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was somebody watching you, you know? I mean, after like, you know, re- I didn't read a lot of Cold War stuff, but I thought this is, this is hilarious. You know? Yeah. So it, it literally would pop and they, you wait in there for at least a half an hour. I don't know if they expect you to sit there and read the magazines, you know, and say, oh, you know. Yeah. Do you cool. think they were taking photos for their records or? Oh, yeah, I'm sure they took. Yeah. I'm sure they, they took pictures. Somehow. Yeah. Hey, this guy, this guy speaks Russian. He's got to be CIA. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they made me sit there for a while and just see if I was, what magazines I was reading. I don't know what they were doing. It was, it all looked pretty crude, but looking back on it, I think like maybe that little slot with the eyes, it almost looked like somebody carved it out with like a sharp steak knife. Yeah. Looking back on it, that might've just been, you know, well, who knows? You know, you, you know, once you start doing a podcast about espionage and intelligence, you start second guessing every every single encounter that you've oh, had. Yeah. I've had probably had that. Experience. Oh yeah, yeah. Anyway, but I my you know once I kind of got through then then there's checkpoint Bravo, which is right at the edge of Berlin, and then once you get into town, um, that was part. The second thing that threw me is that don't these people realize a cold war is going on? That there's that there's a war. I just saw the enemy face to face and everybody was just walking. Everybody's just walking around Berlin. Like it was New York or something. Yeah. Um, that's kind of what threw me at first. I, th- I thought everybody would have this sort of, you know, shrouded tense suspicion, <laughs> but um, yeah. no, it was, it was springtime. Everybody was having a great time. It was a beautiful place. Yeah. And it's a huge place really. I mean, you know, you've got all those lakes and woods and parks. It's, Oh, I know it. Yeah. It's not yeah, we because we, we were in the American sector, which was, I mean, it was some pretty choice real estate. You know, we had a place on Hoot, I had a little place near Hoot and Vague, and I could just go to Schlachtensee or Krumalanka, and you know, then a little farther over to like the, the Havel, and it was beautiful. So, did did you have any uh, special training for Berlin? No, I mean, I, I was an engineer, and um, you know, my specialty was was as a you know as a combat engineer was to kind of you know plan plan the help plan the battlefield with with whatever whoever the task force commander was and to kind of look at the you know lay of the land and figure out what's the best way to either defend it or to move through it um i sort of liked that thinking part of of being an engineer that you weren't Mm -hmm. just this kind of warrior beast you know you that you had to you had to kind of either prep the battlefield or analyze it and look at things. So no, I didn't really have any, any special training. Once you got to Berlin, everybody went through, I think it was like a week long in processing and there were classes that you had to take it at McNair barracks. I remember those. And what, what did those consist of? Can you remember? Um, Yeah. It's funny. I interviewed this, this one guy, this ambassador parent, and he gave me this term. I thought it was, I thought it was wonderful. And uh, he said, you know, they, because, you know, they would bring me back to Berlin because I, well, I, I knew Berlinery, so they would, you know, ask me, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Berlinery. I was like, well, what's that? He goes, it's everything related to, he was getting patients, like everything related to Berlin. They had all kinds of different rules everywhere. Anyway, anyway, we just called it Berlinery. But I thought that was kind of That's funny. really cool. That was your first introduction to Berlinery where it was, where they basically tell you, okay, here's the way we did things. You do things in, um, you know, West Germany, here's the way we do things in Berlin. They were very, they were really, they were telling us that not only are you, um, you know, you have to use discretion and, you know, be aware of, you know, that people are trying to get information from you, but you also have to project an image, a positive image and strong image of America because, because people are watching you. So it wasn't just like, don't give information. It was sort yeah. of, 
act like you're a great guy. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, so even and in you your down, know. even in your downtime, you have to act as an ambassador for the U.S. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think things had started to it changed a little bit in Berlin. Not, not that much. I mean, they didn't have the one big, they didn't have the big, um, you know, like May Day parade. It wasn't on May Day. I think it was on the 4th of July at McNair where they would kind of, you know, roll the trucks by and the tanks and everything. Yeah. But um, I did find in my, you know, when I, once I did get to my unit, I had some, oh, I forget what they're called CVs. I forget them, but they were like M60 tanks with, you know, high explosive guns on the front. And I remember looking through the kit and there was this, big container of baby oil. I remember asking the, the section, I was like, what, what is this doing? And it's like in like rags and stuff. He goes, Oh yeah, sir. He goes, you're lucky. I was like, well, what's going on? Goes, yeah, we used to have, we used to have to rub everything down with that. You know, that stuff. I said, All right. And then if you, if you look back at those parades and you realize, why, why does everything look so kind of a little bit, it, it looks like it has like an eggshell. Whereas yeah. in West Germany, the rest of the army always had a, like a real matte finish, you know? So, that's where the eggshell came from. Yeah. I thought they just polished them. <laughs> it's baby oil. That was the big Wow, <laughs> that's the big baby secret. Oil color. That's the big secret. That's, that's probably classified the information you've just released onto the podcast. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, you could pretty much shut down your podcast now. I mean, baby oil won the Cold War, so let's let's Well, hey, on. that's gonna be the headline. That <laughs> you've just given me the title of the podcast. That's definitely gonna be it. <laughs> what beat the Russians? It wasn't Ronald Reagan. It yeah. wasn't. It yeah, wasn't. It wasn't you know, the, a policy of containment. No, it was baby yeah. oil. It Johnson wasn't. Johnson. Yeah, it wasn't tear down this wall. It's crack open the baby oil. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Brilliant. So. Brilliant. Did you do any training in uh, Doughboy City? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And what was City? that place like? It, Doughboy City was. Um, you know, later I, I, I went and did a, a – one of the first movies I did was about Operation Gold. I was still a soldier in Berlin, and they said, oh, do you, we're looking for soldiers for this movie. I think it was, this was after the wall had come down, and it was about this – well, you know the Operation Gold, the tunnel that yeah, they yeah. dug underneath. Yeah. And um, I started looking around for the actual location, and it still – I mean, at the time it still existed. There was still remnants of the foundation and the opening of the bunker, although it was filled in. But – it wasn't far from Doughboy City, actually. Right. Doughboy City was strange. Because whenever you went there, there's this little road you kind of went. And I, I went back there recently on a mountain bike, just riding through it. And um, it's still the, it still has this feel of like no man's land. Like you were training on the in the demilitarized zone because you could see the you could see the East German towers not far away, kind of across the field. Yeah. And there were always the um, mission vehicles there whenever we were training, almost like. Um, clockwork. They'd be there in their little lot of little brown ladas with the the Russians. You know, that were so is this the uh, Socksmiths troops? Yeah, yes. Socksmiths. Sox, yeah, Sox, the yeah, yeah. Socksmiths. And we had, yeah, exactly. They were there. You know, these guys oh, packed okay. in a tiny car. And um, uh, what was in Doughboy City? I mean, did that were there buildings and simulations of S bahn stations and things like that, or have I got that mixed up with the British training ground? Um, you might be thinking of Ruleben, right? The British okay. one, yeah. I, th- Rule- I remember Ruleben just being a little more congested. That had a, that had more of a feel of, you know, a really kind of um, buildings were a little bit closer together. I don't think it was quite as big as the one we had. But, um, Doughboy City. It was a collection of uh, at least a dozen cinder block buildings that hadn't, you know, up to like two to possibly three stories, maybe at some point. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was basically, it was a place where you kind of trained on how to, how to attack a city or how to, how to defend a city, like how to, how to move and tactically how to go from yeah. one building to the next. And, um, yeah, I remember one, I remember I, you know, one exercise where we had to just jump in and join infantry. And, uh, I was impressed. It's the way they kind of, take these buildings one by one and i had the only thing i could think i said wow things haven't really changed since the russians you know had to had to go building to building in in berlin as far as tactics go back in 1945 or 40 whatever it was wow so what what were you yeah we would go on but yeah the funny thing about going to doughboy city was taking our vehicles there you know we would just roar out of um andrew's barracks and uh, you know, tanks just rolling over cobblestones through this quiet little 
you know, this little suburb of Berlin into our training area to prepare for, to prepare for a possible war. It all seemed a little strange. I mean, how, how were the Berlin population about you being in their city? How did they treat you? I mean, if you're zooming around, tearing up their cobbles in military vehicles, <laughs> presumably yeah. not overjoyed, or were they generally very friendly and very positive? It really depends on what part of town you're in. I mean, if I was over on like, you know, Meringdam or something like that, um, you know, where, you know, or Kreuzberg, where it was a little more, um, which they kind of discouraged, they discouraged Americans to kind of go into the city after the Bell Disco bombing. You had to yeah. kind of, you, there wasn't really much encouragement. A lot of people didn't really go there. They kind of tried to keep people around the American sector after that. But it really depended on where you were. I think people that live near the barracks were just kind of resigned to it, that this is just the way things are, you know. Um, there wasn't a lot of, you know, vocal complaining, vocal complaints about it. I don't really remember that that much. Right. They just weren't that excited. It was just like, oh, well, it was just something they had to deal with, like the weather or something. Yeah. Yeah, they just got used to you being there. Which I guess yeah, you- it's like, why are you here? Um, because... <laughs> you know- <laughs> <laughs> this is one thing that yeah. was kind of funny just you never really got into that they knew why we were there right yeah but you, you never had to so did you, know. you did you actually meet anybody who was really anti us or you just never got into a situation like that um you know i saw more of that when i was in west germany right. oddly enough there were there was a bar in my hometown right across the street from my house. They allowed no, it was like, you know, I remember seeing signs like on bars and it was like, no, you know, kind Amis, you know, no Americans. Really? And, wow. Yeah. They just called us Amis. Oh, what is Ami? Oh, oh, Amis. Like, it sounded like they're talking, they're saying army, you know, like, yeah. oh, we don't want the army here, but it was uh, Ameri- Americanos. So. Yeah. And that's what but they I called really, them in World War Two as well. I think it's the same, the same name, Amis. the Amis. Yeah. Yeah, and it, when he said armies, it was just like, ugh. You know, <laughs> they just didn't want us around. I think it's because, you know, I, I think in the West Germany is a little more of an issue because there was so, some of these bases, you know, like Kaiserslautern or around Frankfurt, there was such a higher, um, or, or Mainz and Wiesbaden, there was just such a higher number of Americans that, you know, they could literally out, outrun certain communities or overrun certain communities. Yeah. But the thing about Berlin was that, you know, we were split up. I mean, there was 10,000 Americans and there was some French up in the north and there was some, you know, British, wherever they were hiding over there. Yeah, <laughs> the last, steady you know, on, so. steady on, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, we had some, we had some, we had some uh, you know, we, we were split up, so it wasn't, uh, wasn't that much of a problem. Yeah, I had a friend who was, uh, I had a friend who was in the, he's in the Royal Engineers and we used to hang out quite a bit. So yeah. I got to see the British side of things. And I did a one-month exchange with the French unit in the north, actually, at one point. Oh, yeah? So How was all, that? We all kind of got to know each other a little bit. Um, that, was, that was interesting. That was really interesting for a couple of reasons. One, the French, the, the French idea of you know, fighting in a city, their, their whole strategy was more like, um, which I think was a little bit more accurate than what the Americans had planned. The Americans sort of, you know, we had a tank you know, battalion there, we had some infantry and, you know, we would practice, you know, urban warfare in Rulaven, but the Americans would sort of act like we were a much larger conventional force than we were. Whereas the French attitude was, um, we're going to be, we're going to be fighting behind enemy lines. You know, we need to learn, you know, sabotage and raids and things like that. So they, they were teaching you, whereas the Americans were, were teaching you how to set up, you know, a, um, you know, a defensive position with an M60 tank. The French were, were teaching you how to dive under a tank and, and stick an explosive on the bottom of it and then get away safely. So right. that was fun. That was some pretty intense training. And that was just their infantry training. It was all the sort of commando behind the line stuff, which I think is how it would have ended up being, were there any, you know, were there, was there any conventional, you know, conflict going on in Berlin. And also they just had longer lunch breaks. They love to sit sit around and open up their lunch boxes. We had MREs and little bags and they had a big box full of cheese and crackers and cookies and yeah. delicious little pâtés and things. So Did they have wine with it, it as well fun. or is that just a uh, misconception? 
I don't remember them having wine. Not when we were, well, we were just sort of eating out in the, in the field at night, it, we, but they did have hot chocolate. They would pass the, you know, the chocolate show around. Yeah. And uh, that was, that was fun. Yeah. I just get so excited talking about Berlin. I'm just like half interrupting you before you're asking me. The no, 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 no. I don't, know, I don't know what it is about yeah. that place. I was even looking over your website and I was saying, Oh my God, I gotta, we gotta talk. To, I gotta talk to him about Carney and all these other people. It's just fascinating to meet somebody that has, you know, a similar esoteric fascination. So anyway. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of us out there. The more I'm discovering is that, Mm -hmm. you know, you and me, we're not alone. Um, (laughs) You know, there's a a big fascination. And obviously I think you listened to my um, podcast with Shane Whaley of Spybury. Yes. uh, yes. Highly recommended uh, podcast for anybody interested in espionage, uh, fact or fiction. Um, But he's got an equal um fascination and obviously with the cold war conversations facebook page i'm just getting you know loads of people joining that week in week out who um have a similar interest so uh yeah let's keep that? going why is, what is that now? why are people interested in it um no i i i don't know i mean i th- i think it's the bizarreness of having a city well particularly with berlin having a city divided in two on the basis mm-hmm. of ideology you know you can sort yeah. of understand a border in open countryside or along a river or something like that but to have a city split in two um with one side killing their population if they try and get to the other side is a very dramatic and unreal image, which I think just retains people's fascination. Yeah. And there was another thing that struck me when I got there. It's, I mean, on my first day, you know, I had maybe a couple hours before I was going to meet my commander. And he said, I said, well, I'll go for a run. You know, I asked the start of the tent. I said, where, where should I go? We always kind of pulled pranks on each other. He goes, oh, run straight down, you know, whatever it was, Preussen down or whatever street it was, you know, Finkenstein, LA. And then, you know, you'll hit this canal and then take a right. So I just yeah. went down to the canal and I take a right. And of course, there's a, there's the border right there. There's, like, yeah. you know, towers. The guy looking at me with a, with an AK variant. And um, uh, it was pretty real. It was right there. But one of the things that struck me is I thought, well, wait a second. If, you know, if we're, the defender of the free world. Um, how do how do we tolerate this happening? You know, how did we? How did? And that's like a larger question. It's, you know, when they actually started building the wall. You know, there's this American decision to like, yeah, let it go. It's not us. It's and, a, um, it, around that, that time when it was going up, and there was you know there was that one guy, the one young student who was shot crossing, and the Americans, you know, had a big PR snafu saying this isn't our business. And I thought, I don't know. <laughs> it's an interesting question. It, it's something that Shane and I have have talked about as well as to whether it was almost, I think welcomed is probably the wrong word, but it certainly stabilized the situation in Berlin and solidified who, you know, sort of controlled what bit and who controlled, you know, the, the other sectors. Mm-hmm. Um, because I imagine the, you know, the emigration from East Germany was put, putting quite a stress on West Germany as well, to some degree. I don't know. It, it's, it's an interesting one because, you know, they, as you say, nothing was done. It just was accepted as part of the status quo. And then again, what could they have done? Yeah. I mean, you've got that confrontation at Checkpoint Charlie, you know, tank to tank in 61. I think it was 61. And you wouldn't want that happening again. No, no. I mean, what were you going to do? But but on the same but on the same token, it, you did feel a little more secure with the. I, I hate to say it, but in the West, you felt a little safer that there was a, a wall from an American perspective. I mean, I imagine for Germans it's much different, but um, you know, you, there is there is like a certain security with just the structure of a wall. Yeah. You know, granted, it could have been knocked down. I mean, if the Russians were coming through, or even East Germans, they could have gone through it any way they wanted to. But there was a, there was a feeling that oh, we're, we're contained here. Yeah. Well, I think they had various sections that weren't as robustly built as other sections, so they could yeah. easily demolish them and um, come through that way. But I think also the the fact that West Berlin was very heavily subsidised 
oh, made it, you know, not only the, the army, but, you know, people who, you know, the population living there as well. Yeah, what's interesting, I, I noticed in West Berlin, there was a, people wanted to know, like, they didn't really want to know why you joined the army. It was like, ugh, armies, you know, they were just resigned that you were this type of people and they didn't really want to deal, you know? Yeah. Um, I think it had something to do with the, with the liberal attraction to Berlin at the time. I mean, a lot of people went there because they could avoid the draft as well. But I remember people did want to know, why did you as a person join the army? It wasn't automatically accepted that you were this or you, or you were that. I, I do remember people being curious on a personal level. What yeah. You did what you did. But you know, I thought about something that's interesting. Berlin was actually, I mean, there were a lot of, I mean, if you look at the Hansestadts in Germany and, and all these other cities, even, even London used to have a wall around it. And um, yeah, I, I, Berlin was really one of the only cities that was like, you know, was like some of those you know, yeah. city, cities from the, the Middle Ages. You know, it did have a kind of, I, I wonder how that would, would affect the psyche if anybody's ever done a white paper on that. Yeah, that sounds like another podcast episode. <laughs> Not for Wald, today. Welcome That's to like, Walled Cities. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, you, did you actually go over to the East when you were there? Because I have heard that, you know, personnel were sent over on sort of, again, acclimatization tours and just to show what the, you know, what they were uh, defend, defending against. Yes, we weren't really encouraged to go, but it was it was possible. I mean, there are sort of rules that this kind of existed after, you know, the four powers agreement, or the, you know that that it was we were still an occupational force, and we need to. You kind of had to hunt and peck for it a little bit, and a lot a lot of people went by the time I was there because um, a lot of things had been pretty much picked over. But I I thought why why not go? So you could go there and exchange your money, and suddenly you're you know, this wealthy person eating in the best restaurants. So yeah, I did go before the wall came down. I went once with a f- friend of mine, another lieutenant who'd been in Berlin uh, about a year or two longer than I had. And it was interesting. He had this term for people. It's like, oh yeah, he's a good occupier. And I felt like, what, what is that? There was this term, right? These mm. weird terms in Berlin, how things were a little bit different. I was like, what do you, what do you mean a good occupier? And, but there was like a, a kind of, brinksmanship that soldiers in Berlin had to had. And I think it was, I think it was sort of being f- that close to a perceived enemy that you just acted a little bit tougher than you were that you acted, you know, your chest was up a little bit more, you know, yeah. that you didn't, you didn't want to show any, any, any weakness. Um, I think that kind of manifested itself tragically with major Nicholson, which is another podcast episode as well but there was this attitude that you know we need to, you don't need to show this year um yeah whereas i just wanted to kind of listen and see what was going on i didn't really want to you know be an imposing figure there of course yeah. i wasn't as a first lieutenant engineer walking around i didn't have any big secrets to tell so mm-hmm. i wasn't really living in the world of espionage but we did stop in this one bar um not far from alexander plots and just ordered a beer and we had our black overcoats on. So you couldn't really see any, um, you could see rank, but you couldn't see any insignia or what country we were from. And, um, I was talking in German to the, the bartender and, um, he assumed that I was a Russian. <laughs> right. And he started talking about like, ah, oh, you know, so you guys are over in, you know, where, where, wherever it was. And, you know, we don't see many of you guys over here anymore. And, da, 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 da. and I was like, ah, oh. And uh, I realized, wow, this is a, this is a, this could be fun being a spy. <laughs> you know? It's like you just put on a black jacket. Yeah, and somebody yeah you got else. a big black coat on, turn the collar up, job done. I put my collar up. Yeah, I started talking like this. No, I'm not Russian. Who are you talking to? Yeah. But it was, uh, it was, it was fun. I remember meeting people. There's immediately some suspicion. I don't ever remember being followed. I, it just felt like this. It just had this feeling like the city was closed. Yeah. There weren't, weren't people walking around. You went there, I think, as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I went in 89 in May and um, just found it bizarre. I mean, it is a bit like the Alice Through the Looking Glass. It, mm-hmm. It's crossing over. in. It, it's like you cross those few yards through Checkpoint Charlie or Friedrichstrasse, and it's like you've gone back 30, 40 years. 
yeah. you know it, yeah. there's less traffic the buildings look like world war ii's just finished you know riddled with bullet holes and plaster hanging off mm-hmm. um and the, the the thing that i remember and it's in quite a lot of the um the books or accounts you read is that it just smelt different oh with, yeah you know sure. the two stroke engines of the uh of the Japan's. of the cars and they're burning that lignite coal as well. Um, and they're cigarettes. They just smelled like they're burning paper. They're horrible. <laughs> <laughs> what is yeah. in that? Like brown paper or something? I remember no. I, I went, I've been back and then I, once the wall came down I was just fascinated with the place. So I was driving you know, even before they said the Americans could really go over there. I was they would just let me drive through so it was no problem. So I was just, it was like, imagine this, it was like a alternate universe had opened up. Like half the the city was, the city was immediately twice as big mm. and there was a whole other side I hadn't seen before. So I remember driving over there and trying to spend as much time as I could looking at this place that, I mean, a lot of people say when you, oh, we, they, they would suggest Americans go to West Germany to see why we're here, or, or I'm sorry, East Berlin to see why we're here to appreciate the American way of life and democracy and that whole party line. But um, I remember going over there and just feeling bad for these people, mm. you know, thinking, ah, oh, somebody has just nailed their toe to the ground. And, um, yeah. you know, and then after discovering the Vend- it wasn't until I really discovered the Venda Museum here, and that's someone else you might want to interview is Justin Jampool, a really fascinating guy who started this museum, the Venda Museum in the Cold War. Yeah, no, it's on my list. If you can give me an intro, I'd be very oh, appreciative. To, to, yeah, yeah, he, he's a very interesting guy. It wasn't until I went into his warehouse in Culver City in Los Angeles where I, where I was just struck with it. It was, I mean, he has this huge warehouse of sort of furniture, um, you know, clothing, books, statuary, flags, photographs, you know, all kinds of paraphernalia of of that almost what's a, what now you. Could, it's almost like a lost civilization. Yeah. It was like, it was like, I didn't really get to see what was inside these buildings or inside or what life was like in East Germany or for all these people until I got to Los Angeles and went into that museum. So that was fascinating. Yeah. It sounds like an amazing collection that, and so surprising to find it in Los Angeles. Yeah. Well, you know, the funny thing is about, there's another thing about collections. When somebody knows you're collecting things, when they see it, they think of you. And and then it's they let you know, but I mean, he just has he still has stuff coming in. He just people are always saying, "Hey, do you want to do you want this? Do you want to do you want a Trabant? <laughs> you know, <or laughs> whatever it is." Yeah, so, I did an impersonation of Dean Reed. Have you ever heard of him? Dean Reed, the Red Elvis at the, at the Vendor Museum. Justin had a he had a dinner there, like a you know, they reproduced a state one of Honecker's state dinners from. I forget what year, 1984 or something like yeah. that. You know, they had the menus, they had the, they had the same food. It was just for his benefactors for the museum. And did and you use the dinner service as and well? His, yes, they had, they had the same, they had his actual, um, you know, plates and stuff. And oh, wow. And How cool is that? <laughs> it was fascinating. And I, and um, he was telling me about it and I said, well, I play the guitar a little bit, you know, because we we're talking about Dean. I was like, like, you know, do you need entertainment for the state? Because I didn't want to go and just sit there and eat, you know? Yeah, and Justin was totally game. He said, "Oh my god, that'd be great!" So, I got a wig and learned some of Dean Reed's songs, and just kind of showed up strumming my guitar as if he would have done for, you know, Eric Eric. Yeah, Honecker. fascinating guy. Oh, god, is there any video of this dinner? No, but I'll do it again at some point. Oh, okay. I kept oh. the wig. I kept the wig. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm, Maybe they'll, maybe they'll invite me to like, I think they celebrate Dean Reed's birthday in Berlin every year. So I'm trying to get an invitation to that next year and to go play like Eve of Destruction in German or something. Brilliant. So, uh, I know an, yeah, I know an actor in Germany. I was talking about Dean Reed. She said, oh yeah, my agent used to be married to him. <laughs> he was just not, not a big thing, you know. You, you mentioned about the defense of Berlin. I mean, what, do, do you know what the battle plans were for the, for the defense of Berlin or any detail around that? Yeah, that's something I've been kind of digging into as well. And there's this, you know, there was, that was something they talked about at, um, um, like at, like USER, US Army, Europe level and NATO. It was like, what, you know, what is, what is their overall plan here? And my, what, what I've come up with is that they intentionally, um, didn't have a plan. <laughs> <laughs> I, and, and, like, the, 
I'm kind of winging it here, but my, my theory was this, was that I, I think that, you know, if there was a plan, then there suddenly would be this excitement of trying to find it and who would give it up and who would, you know, who would see it. I think that the overall mission there was um, we were like human shields in a way, you know, that if you do want to engage Berlin, we're going to fight, then you would be fighting American forces in your war with the United States. So that was pretty much the main purpose, I think. There was a show, it was a show, not necessarily of force, but just of, you know, residents. Yeah. But, um, I, you know, because there really wasn't much coordination that I remember with the French and the British. I mean, tactically, we had to kind of know how it was going to work. I think they would just wanted people to, I think they were, we were going to kind of wing it. I mean, with the exception of units like, you know, Detachment A, which is declassified now, I mean, they had, you know, they had like a stay behind mission, mm-hmm. um, you know, of sabotage and so forth. Uh, your average engineers, we, we were just, um, we weren't really too sure what was going on. I think it was, we were going to get the, uh, we we're going to get, there was going to be an alarm. We would have alerts occasionally where we just pack up our vehicles and they wouldn't really tell us where we were going to go. Like we did in West Germany. Yeah. Um, I did get a hold of the battalion's plan at one point and found out that the battalion headquarters was going to be in Fairbelliner plots. <laughs> right. And I had a girlfriend that like lived near Fairbelliner plots. So, you know, casually I mentioned to her like, Hey, could I use your apartment if we go to war? And she's like, Oh, absolutely. So, <laughs> um, you know, I had a plan. I had a plan personally <laughs> where yeah. I was going to go. So you didn't really know. So even though you were doing training and things like that, you didn't know where you'd actually be deployed if the uh, the the wall came down and the Red Army came pouring over. No, but to be honest with you, I think that they wanted to keep us mobile as well because a lot, a lot of our training was going on at um, – uh, a Bergen training area, which was right where the Bergen Belsen concentration camp was. Hmm. That was a strange experience. You come up with some bizarre discoveries there once in a while, but we would train there uh, more or less in the British kind of sector of West Germany. So um, yeah, we would train, we would train there and, you know, then come back into the city. Doughboy city was pretty much the, the, the infantry was using that most of the time. We would help them like in support, you know, but it was, yeah. just, it was all sort of strange. We didn't really know what the, but we did know that we were surrounded by, you know, a hundred thousand Russian soldiers, <laughs> yeah. you know? So it was, it was kind of futile in some respect. Yeah. You know, we trained in the city. If they just said, Oh, you know, go down first and Dom and block the street, then, you know, we would have, we would have done it. So. Yeah. And you, you briefly mentioned that you, you had a friend in the Royal Engineers. I mean, did you have much contact with the British? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we did. I mean, I stayed at, he was, he was an officer. I stayed at their officer's club. Oh my God. You guys drank and drank all the different, I could, there were so many different types of alcohol. I couldn't keep track of it. And then the port came out and then, you know, they're wearing yeah. these red uniforms. Yeah. I felt like toasting the queen as well. I'm sure to- the queen thing. Oh my God. It was hilarious. <laughs> we, we had a, yeah, there's the queen and the Royal, this and the Royal that. And, uh, a lot of pomp and circumstance. And the uniforms were just beautiful. This like whatever that red color is that you guys, you guys. Yeah. Have, you know? um, um, anyway, there's those red uniforms. Then there's this weird thing they did like on a, this kind of wrestling with your legs. You know, you just kind of fight with like your legs on your, you know, people sitting on top of you. Anyway, this was, was just bizarre. <laughs> but um, the British were like, they were really the king of this whole brinksmanship. I, I, I have to say the idea of like a good occupier, and I'm kind of going out on a limb here, was something I think it was, it was a British, it was a, a British invention because they had a little bit of a different attitude. I mean, you guys had that whole, you know, air raid with the Nazis. You were much more, much more invested and I think, you know, there was Dunkirk. I mean, you look back on it, you think, oh, my God, there was a much different war. World War II was a much different war for the British than it was for the Americans. And you could see that just by the different attitudes um, toward the Germans and, you know, toward being an occupational force. Yeah. And then I guess, you know, the, the, the British, they seemed, a little, they, they seemed a little harder, you know, and I think that has something to do with, with people being rotated through Northern Ireland as well. So, I mean – you know, my, my, my friend that we, we would hang out with, he would, he'd been to Berlin a couple of years before I did. So he would kind of, he would sh- show me into the town and into the city a little bit. 
I mean, it was, I was just, I, I was just kind of impressed with the way, um, like British sort of wield the English language a little differently than Americans. Americans kind of, sure, we speak English, you know, but the British have it like, uh, it's almost like they're proud of their language as well. You know, and, and I, I was always amazed at how unapologetic they were that they don't, that they didn't speak any other languages. It was like, no, we speak English. And, you know, it wasn't like, I mean, there are exceptions, but I just remember some, some of the officers there that was like, oh, you don't understand? Well, then I just need to speak English louder. You know? And slower, yeah. <laughs> louder and slower and you'll be able to figure it out, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, that hasn't changed. No. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> where, where and when, where were you when you heard that the wall had uh, opened? I was, uh, I, was, I was in my apartment on Flanagan Straza, near the Hootenweg in West Germany. And when was it? It was in November. Um, yeah, I think for some reason, I think it was on a weekend. I'm not really sure. But um, yeah, I just got a call from a, a friend of mine. She said, oh, you got you to gotta come down here. And I think it was about like four o'clock in the morning or something like that. And, um, I said, Oh, you, she goes, the, the, wall, the wall is coming down. You got to get it. You got to get down here. And, um, I couldn't really believe it. I mean, I turned on the radio station. They didn't have anything on it on a, on the, um, American radio. I didn't have a TV yeah. either. So I couldn't really watch it. So I just got in my old BMW and just drove down to, um, drove down the gate just as the kind of sun was coming up. And, uh, yeah, there were just people standing on the, on the, like literally standing on the wall. I mean, you've seen the pictures, people chiseling yeah. away. I started chiseling away, then I realized, okay, this is going to be a lot of work. <laughs> well, that bit around the Brandenburg Gate is probably the toughest bit to uh, chisel on. It was certainly the thickest <laughs> part of the wall anyway. You start chiseling on that, and you think, okay, um, I'm going to wait for the professionals to come in. Especially yeah. as an engineer, you're like, okay, this is like, you know, 40 years of settled concrete. Yes. Yeah, bring out the baby oil. That'll sort it out. I was going to explain to everyone, listen, here's what happens when you <laughs> reinforce concrete sits in the same place weighing on itself for 40 years, you know. <laughs> Don't even try to break it up. But yeah, the baby oil wasn't working. But I was, yeah, I, w- I look at those pictures and I think, oh my God, that was, I was there. I was standing in a, you know, wearing a brown bomber jacket as long as my hair possibly could be, wearing stonewashed jeans, you know, standing yeah. there. And I remember then the inside of the Brandenburg Gate were the soldiers, um, the East German guards, but they weren't armed. They were just standing in a semicircle about 20 feet from the edge. Yeah. And I remember taking a picture of that, just looking at us curiously. Like, what? They didn't appear, they didn't look afraid. They just didn't see what was going on. I mean, I walked around a little bit. I walked up a little bit toward the, um, toward the Reichstag, and there was actually a hole in, in the wall. A part yeah. of it was broken down and I looked through it and people were just using the regular, regular way through, but somebody had cut like a little hole big enough to get through. And on the other side was a Russian, it was a, a border guard. And um, yeah, I offered him a cigarette. He said, sure. So I passed, you know, I passed him yeah. a marble through a hole in the wall and we smoked a cigarette and just shot the shit for a little while as people were kind of streaming through. Wow. What, I mean, what, what did you t- I'm fascinated to know what you talked about what the weather was like or <laughs> yeah it's like how's it going he's like oh yeah. good i was like what, what what's going on he's like oh they opened it and um i said what do you, you know, I, I don't remember the specific but i just remember him being not really sure that it was going to it was going to last you know yeah. and he didn't he didn't seem like he was one of these um you know, sort of militant guard people you know guards yeah. Along, along the wall. He just seemed to be kind of watching it. I just remember both of us were just caught up in events as if we were both watching, you know, this huge sort of, I don't want to wax poetic or something, but it, it just seemed as if we were watching some, you know, like either a huge wave or some kind of force of nature happening, something way beyond our control. Yeah. Um, and did he, did he know you were American? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, right. he's, American and he's like, oh, yeah. He was a little suspicious, I think, but I, I think, you know, cigarette kind of broke the yeah. ice a little bit. Yeah. Well, if you'd had your black coat on with the collar turned up, he probably would have been more <laughs> suspicious. He basically told me everything. He told me all the secrets of yeah. the streets. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he's still working for me now. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I look forward to him on a future episode of your podcast. <laughs> yeah, the guy, the guy at the gate. 
But I I would love to talk to one of those guards actually and just have a, a a chat with them. You know, what was it like and what was that day like? You know, that must have been just so bizarre because you know, hours before you've been told shoot to kill, and then you're just told don't do anything. <laughs> Let people go. <clears throat> it's open. Let yeah. them go. Yeah. Did you see that film, Bornhold, Born, Bornhold, Holder Oh, Born? that is great. That's great. That it starts with the dog yeah. wandering over to the other side and like, what do we do? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's a dog crossed over, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But you actually watch the um, TV film of what actually happened on the night. And it's exactly the same. These guys are just bemused by... You know, they've got no orders. They're under this huge pressure of these people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they've got no option but to open fire or open the gates. You know? Yeah, I mean, the guy that wanted to put the machine gun up there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, It it was like a real collision of... of, It was a strange event. I mean, looking back on it now, we're so lucky there wasn't, like, one shot, you know, or just something happened. Suddenly, it would have been, oh, we're, you know... Yeah. Well, I think the most bizarre is that whole press conference where Shabovsky sort of just doesn't really know what he said. And then they ask him, well, well, well when does this happen? And it's like immediately, so forth. <laughs> he looks down at the paper, right? He yeah. looks down at the memo and he's like, oh, yeah. You know, immediately. Yeah. 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 It's right just, now. it's almost like it happened by accident. I know it was yeah. planned, you know, they were planning on opening the border, but you had to get a visa and, you know, there was going to be some sort of red tape there. But that whole, you know, 9th of November evening was complete, you know, screw up. What what was the initial feeling within your unit about the wall opening? Did there, Was there a feeling that, well, that's over, we can go home? Or was it sort of, oh, this is a bit of uncertainty. I wonder what's going to go on here. Well, we didn't really know what the Russians were going to do. So that was a little, so it was a little tense because, you know, there was 1953 and there was Czechoslovakia and there was Hungary. I mean, there was all those different yeah. times when the Russians had just kind of said, oh yeah, go ahead have a good time. You know, and then, and then the hammer would come down. So um, the Americans were, we were kind of locked down. We couldn't leave the city, we couldn't go near the wall. Um, we just had, I just remember it being a little bit, it was hopeful, like as a human, you're like, oh, this is great. But, yeah. you know, as far as your duty goes, they said, all right, stick tight, guys. Keep your head in the game. We might have to do something. We don't we don't really know. But I, I, it definitely was, I definitely had the feeling that whatever was going to happen, that we weren't going to be engaging. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was more like just pull back and, you know, stay quiet. And yeah, let them sort it the out. Wall, stand up on the wall cheering, <laughs> sharing cigarettes with border guards you know so yeah yeah i mean it's just uh, you know you uh, just an amazing historical moment i mean it's a bit it's almost like uh you know you think of like moments in you know the russian revolution like the storming of the winter palace and thing, things like that you know being in berlin when the wall opened is one of those moments oh it was just amazing yeah. so i did i did chisel away the wall for a little while but you, you felt like, I mean, I felt like I had to keep going back to, to process it, to make sense of it. And I think other Berliners did as well. I mean, more and more, after the first day and the second, third day, it just turned into like a, you know, it was like Woodstock. There's just more and more people there coming in from West Germany to kind of see it. And it was like you're trying to, pro, people were, would, would go back and try to process it, you know. And then yeah. you just see these Germans kind of streaming through. And, but I, I do remember chiseling away and, that, and um you know, Dan Rather was there and uh, I saw him walking around a trench coat with some guards and, um, you know, I just, I just walked near, near, not far from him. He's like, Dan, you know, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he's, you know, one of his guards turns around and puts like a hand to my chest. He's like, no, no, you know, I'd like to talk with Dan, Mr. Rather. I'm an American. And he's like, ah. So he goes, Mr. Mr. Rather. And he comes over and he said, yeah. And I just handed him a little piece of the wall. It's like, I just wanted to, hand, to give this to you. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, thank you, thank you very much. And put it in his trench coat and turned around and got in the cherry picker and continued his reporting. That's taking but, pride of place on his mantelpiece even now, you know. It could be right now, yeah. <laughs> I got a feeling it ended up getting crushed into dust in the bottom of his burberry oh. jacket, but you never know. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was a fascinating time. It was this it was feeling like, oh wow, this is happening. Yeah. What what did you most like about being in the army? I you know, I really most I most liked a, a sense of um a sense of clear if not purpose, but like uh, you know, at least a, at least a, at least a direction. There was always more you you could you you could do, and there's a big group of people. I missed. I mean, I missed the sense of purpose, and I missed the camaraderie. I miss. I miss the people. Yeah, probably most of all. Yeah, I don't know. that's probably. Yeah. And you know what? I, I have to admit, I do miss um, cargo pants. Although I wear them as a civilian, I mean, having that extra pocket is just it's essential. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how else to say it. No, that's great. No, that's it's good. Probably, what did you least like about being in the U.S. Army? What I least liked about it were was exactly what is exactly what I being like a podcast host or or doing what you're doing is you couldn't really do what you're doing right now. There's yeah. you just there was you could ask a couple of questions and then it was stop. You know, it's either it's beyond your brief. It's, you know, it's, yeah. it's this, you don't have to know. There was this, there was this weird kind of need to know thing, especially yeah. in, in Berlin. You just didn't ask questions about people. You didn't want to get to know people like it, knowledge more of a liability than an asset yeah. <laughs> in the army, at, at least for, for a large part of the conven- conventional force at the time. Yeah. So that's probably that. There was, there wasn't a lot of questioning. Like, why are we here? Why are we doing this? Yeah, but you, you you said you were out in the Gulf Gulf War. Yeah, yeah, I went to the Gulf. That was a strange transition, going from Berlin Wall coming down, and then, you know, uh, shortly after, you know, being sent to to the desert. But yeah, I was there for about four months. I was mostly yeah. in a yeah. It was bizarre because I'd learned German. They sent me to this unit that had German tr- that had trucks from the East Germans. They right. <laughs> oh yeah. They had to put together these hedge transportation units because once the Scud missiles started dropping, most of the civilians said, no, we're not going to work anymore. Yeah. So we had to put these transportation units together. So they sent me and this other linguist to kind of translate their manuals to the mechanics, which didn't really take that long. I mean, you know, a piston is a piston. Whatever yeah. Language. It wasn't like you had to explain ideology or anything. So that was pretty quick. So I was just a convoy platoon leader, just transporting bombs and things up to the along the pipeline road yeah and into, and into kuwait city yeah so that must have been a bit bizarre because i mean obviously there was a danger of a scud or something happening there so there was more of a direct threat to your life than you ever had in berlin oh absolutely yeah berlin was much more yeah kind of in theory yourself, you know but you know, when you had to put your gas mask on at night and then wait for the explosion to see where it landed, <laughs> to see where it landed, yeah. that was a little. Tough. I mean, I was never like under direct fire or anything, but the Scud yeah. missiles were a little s- scary because they were they were targeting them for like where we were, and one landed a um about a quarter mile away, I think, and did some damage. Quite did a lot of damage, but that in the realization, I think the realization that there, and I've listened to other people talk about this, like what is what is kind of shocking me about being in a, you know, war. And, and like I said, I didn't have a live combat situation, but the realization that there is another human trying to take your life can be, can have its own kind of subtle traumatic. Yeah. You know, once you have that realization, it's like, wait, this is my own species and they're trying to kill me. I mean, people have that when, you know, when they've been attacked and mugged or, you know, whatever. So I remember feeling that, thinking, whoa. And then also realizing, oh, wait a second, my government's cool with this. You know, the rest of the people are cool with this, that, you know, for this political purpose, we're cool with sacrificing your life. Yeah. And then that's when it suddenly hit me. I thought, wait a second, why? Yeah. Why aren't people protesting this war or asking questions or, why, or asking why are we really here or what is, I mean, we, you know, it, it did, I re- looking back, I mean, I realized why we we're there. And even at the time I realized, but, you know, I, I didn't want, I remember at the time thinking, I don't want people, I don't want their unwavering support. You know, I want people questioning and saying, why are we, is this the best way? You know, mm. is, are there, is there any other way? Well, how else can we do this? So that was probably my, my experience of going to a, going to a war zone. Yeah. I thought, yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Tell us about live drop then. How did you get into the podcasting lark? 
I was, I was interested in talking with people from the intelligence community. They're a little cagey. They're not always, in, they're not always the most, um, um, you know, forthcoming, forthcoming. Yeah. It was kind of challenging. You sort of get this, I don't know about you, but I kind of have this little feeling of pride that I've actually had an hour conversation with somebody who'd been a former spy or been in the intelligence community, you know, cause it's not always e- that easy to find things to talk about when so much of their life is classified, or whatever. But, yeah. um, but it was also something I'd been interested in as a, as a kid and it just kind of re- revived that for me, you know, and um, uh, I, I thought to myself, wow, these are, this would be kind of cool to just talk with people from the intelligence community. Because if, if I could reveal something about, if they could reveal something about a place where I had lived for four years that I didn't know was going on, what else, what else can these, these people, you know, tell me about where I am right now or, or other places that I was or places that I will be or what, what other things do they know that I don't know? And, um, yeah, that was probably probably my uh, that was my thought about this is I could turn this into some sort of interview show or some kind of podcast. And I mean, at the time there was you and there was Spycast, and um, I thought, well, these guys will let me join, let me let me in the door. You know, <laughs> this could be kind of fun. I'll figure out my own voice and what I'm really interested in and who I'm talking to, and we'll all have a good time. Techniques of talking and doing interviews and. Um, you know, I just started to develop a show and put yeah. it together over the course of the past year and started recording episodes and working on it. And then, yeah, then once you, yeah, be careful if you tell too many people about what you're doing, either you lose interest or you actually end up, end up doing it. So, <laughs> well, yeah, you'll have to give me some tips on interviewing. I'm still, uh, still at the learning phase. So what, what else have you got lined up on live drop or are you, uh, keeping it classified for the moment oh it's all classified right now um well i'm gonna i've spoken with john kiriaku he was the uh, former cia officer who kind of blew the whistle on the torture program and i had an interview with him and one with dimitri trenin he was one of the first interviews i did uh of the carnegie institute moscow he's a former uh mission member so the uslm Oh, yeah, Sox yeah. members. So um, I had a chance to talk with him briefly. And, um, well, it's, you know, some, some of my friends from Berlin, I try to keep going back to uh, Berlin as often as I can and interviewing people who were there when I was there. I mean, I had a good friend who worked at Teufelsberg and hadn't really told me about what, what he did until now. Yeah. And it was interesting to hear what he was listening to, what they were yeah. capable of doing. Um, yeah, kind of declassifying everything like that. So it was him yeah. and, uh, yeah, there's some interesting people. I might. Yeah, no, I was looking at your list. There's some uh, ones I'm, I'm looking forward to. I want to get on to the, uh, the quick fire round because I have, we have spent almost two hours, <laughs> believe it or not. Oh, my God, time flies. Uh, my first question is, what is your favorite Cold War film or Cold War era film or film about the Cold War? Um, I have to say my favorite one now is, it's a show counterpart on stars right now because it's, it doesn't really get bogged down with, you know, who, who the, who the enemy was or exactly who the, you know, who the Russians were, who the Germans were, whatever, whoever it was we were spying against. Um, it, it just, it treats it like it's an alternate universe, which I think was a little bit, which I think was the sort of, that, that was like the kernel of interest that, that kind of fascinated me about berlin it wasn't so much that it, what i knew it was what i what i didn't know that really interested me and that, you know trying to figure out that world is pretty cool yeah so i'm i'm enjoying that show that's probably my favorite but you know i do have something to admit to you i'm not a big fan and i know i know the um this um the spy berry is gonna 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 kill me for this when i talk about it. i'm not really that big on spy literature i don't know I'm like, I'm like tearing through the book. Like, what, 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 what do they, what do they need to know? What do they? How do, how do I find this out? I, I find them. I get a little, I get a little frustrated. Which, you which, you're, which are you talking about? Particular authors, or are you just? I you like know, Len- you're not, you're not daring to denigrate John Le Carrier and Len Dayton, are you? I think, I think Len Dayton. 
right. I'm a little bit like, come on, on, let's get to the point. I might have to end the interview here, Mark. You know, <laughs> me and my friend Shane. <laughs> I do like I like John McCarr. You know, I like I like John McCarr though. So yeah, yeah, yeah. There no, I know, and it's there's different tastes for the diff, you know the the different styles of of writing. But um, yeah, no, yeah, no, that to, that's. I need to revisit. I need to expand my canon. You know, yeah. Into this. So, uh, what piece of music would you choose as your soundtrack? to the cold war or your time in West Germany and Berlin? Um, it has to be, um, it has to be David, David Bowie. It's probably, probably Ziggy Stardust. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's no, a good that, choice. I think it's that song. Um, let's see other, other songs that kind of come to mind when I was there. In West Germany was different, but in Berlin it was much more like Bowie and um like Lou Reed Dirty Boulevard. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. I think that there's probably Dirty Boulevard and I mean there was of course five years because we had to serve five years in the military, then we're then we we're out. So I was yeah. counting down the five years, you know. I I think that whole album. And okay. then Lou Reed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, that that's good. That's good. And... I'll tell you the time I met Lou Reed next time we talk. <laughs> what you keep coming out with these little oh, gems, like how I started World War Three and yeah. how I met Lou Reed. I finally met Lou Reed. I mean, I went to one of his shows in Berlin. And he just sat there, you know, smoking and playing and talking to the audience in this little spot, like in Neukölln or something. It was really cool. But, yeah. Okay. We'll save that. We'll keep the we'll listeners save. on tenterhooks for episode two. Episode two. Um, what happened with Lou Reed? Do you have you got any Cold War items that you've kept or collected? Yes, um, I've got my little briefcase full of stuff. And the thing that I'm most proud of is my little French commando badge. My little, it's a little pin. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you can just a little lapel pin. It's not even like an official medal or something, but yeah, it was like a little bit of training that I went through with the French. I was like, ah, oh, I like that. Nobody really knows what it is, but. It's probably that. And then there's a piece of the wall that I have. Yeah. And I'm naming a few things. So what, what would be your most prized one? Would it be the pin? If I had to lose everything, what would it be? Yeah. Um, you know what I would keep? I would probably keep the little, I'd probably keep this arm patch that we had that had an American flag on it. It was like this little arm patch that we did when we marched in Nijmegen. And that was before I got to Berlin, but I'd probably... Because that was just like, that was, that was 100 miles. <laughs> you have to walk and put that on. So that's the one I'd probably keep. Okay. Okay, that's good. That's good. Um, if you could invite three people from the Cold War period, um, alive or dead, um, to have a few beers with, who would they be? Dan Rather, I guess, is one of them. <laughs> Dan <laughs> Yeah, but he just kind of blew me off, though. So I don't know. Yeah, I feel, yeah. I don't. I don't want to like go back to the well. Let's see. Who else would it be? You know, I would love to sit down from the Cold War. I guess in Berlin. I mean, I used to go hang out at the jungle, you know, and um, you know, just hope that David Bowie would walk in sometime. But I, I would have loved to have met David Bowie at some point while I was there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So David Bowie, um, Wild Bill Donovan. Yeah, yeah, the, the OSS. OSS, yeah. Yeah, I just think he would have been fascinating. And um, probably Hedy Lamar. so. Oh, okay. Okay, good combination. Have you got any particular yeah. questions you'd like to ask them? Let's see, for Wild Bill? Yeah. I would just try to get him talking, you know, and just kind of listen and just to hear what's, what, stories, what stories he had. I. I, I think I'd want to know like what his what his influences were like what, what what he was what he was kind of modeling the OSS after you know and and what for him were his most most exciting missions that that they you know planned and coordinated and the ones that didn't the ones that we don't hear about yeah so probably that and um what would I ask David Bowie I don't know I'd ask him to explain to me who he is you know I yeah. think all of his work is this experimentation with 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 identity and um you know and a lot of people 
and, and even even Berlin in the Cold War, you know, it's like which which side are you on? You know, yeah. on that. Um, there's some things in the Cold War that made it much easier to know who you were. There were there was which which side people were on, and um, and what your attitudes were. So I think I would probably ask I'd probably ask him that. How do you know who you are? Okay. <laughs> so, and Hedy Lamar. Hedy Lamar. Um, I'd probably want to talk to her about this this whole thing she she invented. I'd want to get down to the real math of it and say w- what was so exciting about that. It was like a it was like a VHF communicator or something like that. I forgot what it was. Yeah, I've uh, some people throw some doubt as to how much you know whether she did invent oh, it. Oh right, yeah, there was certain, you know, there was there's a bit of controversy spinach. there. But yeah. yeah, you're right. Actually, find out the truth of that. Um, I'd like to get to the bottom story. of that. Okay. And um, yeah, and see, like, yeah, she's why she want to be an actor? Okay. Why take chances on something like this when you, you know, you got a good acting career coming along? Yeah. Okay. And are there any uh, books in English that you'd recommend for anybody interested in Cold War Germany or Berlin? Yes. Um. I really liked uh, Stasi Myth and Reality um, by Mike Dennis. Um, right. It's one of the thinner ones. I mean, there's you know there's the Firm, which is which is which is pretty good, and Stasi Land and all those. But I uh, I like Stasi Myth and Reality. Dennis he gets to the point pretty quick. And um, let's see what else would I recommend. There's another one called uh, the. Um, the Traitors Among Us by Colonel Stuart Harrington. I thought that was interesting because he, he, he talked about, um, you know, the counterintelligence operations in Berlin and in, in Berlin and West Germany in the eighties. I mean, I had no idea that while I was stationed in, you know, in Dexheim with the eighth ID that, um, you know, that operation Canasta player where a, where a hung- Hungarian had kind of, um, quarters in Bad Kreuznach where they had basically user's battle plan. So, so, the rest yeah. of, so, so much of that was, was just, uh, was actually, you know what, there's another person I'd like to talk to and that would be James Hall. Right. I'd like to talk to him. I mean, he was in Berlin around the same time I was. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, 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 he just, we were selling stuff to the Russians and to the Germans at the same time and they didn't know about it. And I just thought, yeah, he's a kind of, a, kind of a brazen spy. Um, there's, yeah, there's that. Let's see what other books. And I thought Comrade Rockstar was pretty cool. I think there's another appendix coming. Okay, well, no, th- those are those are great, great recommendations. Traitors Amongst Us, I have got on my shelf and uh, haven't read it in a while, but I remember thinking, wow, <laughs> didn't know anything about that. Uh, a bit yeah, like you. Yeah, um, yeah interesting. Yeah. I really appreciate your time with me and i also want to thank you for your uh, service as well um, thanks Ian. no no absolutely humble to you know speak to you and hear um your story and also some insight into you know what goes through your mind when you're in those sort of situations as well that that's really you know really interesting okay well thank you thanks mark appreciate thanks, it Ian. bye okay bye Well, I talked with Mark for over two hours and there is some extra material available on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Cold War pod. I was genuinely honoured to speak to Mark. Again, another eyewitness of uh, such important pieces of history. There's extra information in the show notes. The show notes can be found at coldwarconversations.com slash the word episode and the number 16. We're also on Twitter and Facebook. Just search for Cold War Conversations on both of those. If you like what you're hearing, please leave reviews on iTunes or with your podcast provider. Thank you very much for listening and goodbye. This is the Voice of America, Washington, D.C., signing off. (laughs) 